Welcome to Beyond the Art, where creativity knows no bounds and innovation takes center stage. Join us on a captivating journey through the realms of the Native American art world, exploring the untold stories, inspirations, and the sheer brilliance that fuels the world of Indigenous artistry. Well, welcome to Beyond the Art, and today we have with us Nani Chacon. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, why don't you go ahead and share with us a little bit about your background and journey into the world of art and muralism? Yeah, um, I began creating murals about, um, well, I guess the full the full scope of it was I started making public work when I was 15. And that work was created by making graffiti. Um, I did mm. graffiti or was a writer, graffiti writer for about 10 years. And that was my sole practice. It wasn't anything that um, I branched out too far beyond that community. Um, I wasn't really interested in like putting my stuff in galleries or kind of pursuing that. That was really the main scope of art production that I was interested in and that I created. And it taught me a great deal. Um, I think it really it really um, created the ethics that mm -hmm. I hold today around public art, that art should be accessible, that art has um, the capacity to change our environments, um, that it can act as an intercessory, it can um, interject in spaces and also create agency within those spaces um, for our communities and for ourselves. And so kind of fast forward, you know, um, through a life few years, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> life a little bit. Went, you know, ha had some life changes, had a child, was a teacher for a while, um, still continued making art. Um, despite, you know, was kind of on a, on a different career path for a while, but um, about 10 years ago, decided that I just wanted to completely dedicate my life to pursuing an art artistic career and um, just started kind of like from the ground up. And that was, I, I had received a mural commission um, from somebody that knew kind of both of my capacities as a painter and mm -hmm. as, a, as a graffiti artist and was like, you know, would you be interested in creating a mural? And Putting those two ideas together and being able to create work in that scale um, on a wall, right. public surface, all of the things was really just like this, this feels right. This feels good. This is what I want to do. Um, and then with that kind of under having the understanding that to be able to create work in a public space um, is really transformative and should be. Um, that I have this capacity to be able to, um, I mean, art is, art is a voice, art is a language mm -hmm. that we are sharing and that we are engaging with and um, wanted to create the works as community engaged pieces. So as of now and for the past um, 10, 15 years or so, um, I want to say like 80% of the mural works that I create are within a community engaged process. Um, that process differs per project, but um, yeah, it, it's really about creating dialogue and communication and altering spaces. Um, and yeah, that that's kind of kind of that whole um, kind of way that that came about. Your work often reflects themes of indigenous culture and identity. How does your cultural heritage as a Diné Navajo influence your artistic vision and the messages that you convey through your art? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's always going to it's always going to influence my ideas because that mm -hmm. is the way that I was. That's the lens that I was. That's the lens I see through. I see uh -huh. through, I see through the lens of an indigenous woman living in an urban. Um, landscape for now and, <laughs> and, inter, and intermingling through that but it is also very um rooted into my homelands and that's that's the language that i speak that's my accent um 
and it, it'll always influence it. I, I, I love finding those opportunities when I can explain and connect with people through that lens, um, because I think that those are the unique um, similarities that bind us. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when I can speak through a lens that somebody else may not have um, the experience of, but yet can find an understanding within the work, um, despite, I think that that's, you know, then, then that, that is the magic and that is the beauty and the power of art in general. Um, so always, I think I always create, I, I, you know, no matter the project, no matter if it looks, um, Diné, if it looks indigenous, if it looks Mm -hmm. Navajo, if it looks feminine, if it looks anything, um, or doesn't, it's always coming from that lens and perception. Can you walk us through your creative process when approaching a new mural or painting? How do you decide on themes and imagery when you start the process? Is it something that you dream about? Is it something that you write down on a piece of paper and kind of go from there? Or is it just like, boom, you're in your studio and you start creating? Um, you know, sometimes I think there's like a little bit of all of that. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, in the initial phases and, you know, it's, it's, I think it would be the same way that I would ask a writer or somebody like, how did you come up with that idea or that, or, you know, a director, like, how did you come up with that concept and that way of thinking about that concept or, or that movie or book or whatever? Um, I guess, you know, sometimes it is a little bit of just pure inspiration and seeing something. I think I, I tend to gravitate towards the ideas that kind of like, nestle and settle in my mind um and just won't leave um and they're kind of this like thing this like tick in the back of my mind maybe at the moment it's I'm not exactly sure where all those pieces might fit or come (laughs) together but there is something you know that there's something there that just it just is like and it just won't leave me alone and that's probably why I make art anyway (laughs) um but the the kind of like the meat of the process Um, I think sometimes is really research-based and kind of pulling at at these threads Mm -hmm. of of research, of um, investigation, kind of contemplation, thinking over something. Uh, That's probably the side. And and because a lot of my work has some representational elements and is somewhat illustrative, I think people always want to be like, oh, you, you're just inspired and it like came out of you. And, um, you know, sometimes I struggle with a lot of ideas of how to really be intentional with, um, especially with the figurative stuff, you know, like the, mm-hmm. way, the way somebody may be, the body may be positioned or the way that I um, interject different symbols or um, other elements within that frame of work. Uh, the community engaged work is always very, very interesting because that process I feel is very challenging and organic. Um, I don't start out projects with a preconceived notion. Sometimes I will have like a loose maybe idea or commonality or something that may be kind of interesting, but usually it begins with engaging with community members first at like a communication level Mm. and building trust and then thinking about an issue or thinking about um something a topic thinking about an idea feeling um a contradiction whatever um and then pulling it apart from there and having sharing and lending some of that process to maybe people that aren't even artists or haven't considered art, but being able to generate art ideas, discussion, um, what is meaningful from a place of trust first, and then Mm -hmm. being able to lend that to generating ideas and, and thinking about space and concepts. So yeah, that one is always interesting. And sometimes I go into a project thinking it's going to be about one thing and it doesn't. (laughs) by the end of the conversations, because a lot of the times I feel like one 
for a non-artist, which I which I prefer to work with. I don't think I've worked with too many. I haven't collaborated with too many artists. And sometimes that's a, like, you know, that's a, a dance within itself because you're both very, very versed in your aesthetics. So you're finding room mm-hmm. for that. Um, working with non-artists, like, you know, working with teachers or linguists or, um, you know, elders or children, you know, they haven't had that opportunity to translate their ideas onto one, a large, a large scale public space. And then two, just to like visualize and think about um, their ideas and communicating beyond just literal means of narration. So Mm -hmm. we kind of always start at this place where it's like, um, you know, we're going to talk about this issue and it's like, okay, well, we should show like a policeman hitting someone, (laughs) (laughs) you know, like maybe we don't want to be that literal, but like what is the feeling (laughs) that generates from that, you know, or or what is, what is the imagery of losing your language? You know, what, what is, you know, how, how do we start to, to think about that? How do we start to emotionalize that? How do we make, the like weight and complexity of these issues become something that you can feel when you immediately see it. So those are mm-hmm. always incredible um, conversations. It's just, it's an incredible and very like sacred part of process that every time I get to engage with it and create a piece um, in that manner, it's it's really fun and challenging and different, completely different every time. They kind of they kind of take a life upon its own and go its own direction after you begin the process. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I think I think that's part of um, that's part of the transformation, right? Like that's part mm-hmm. of of being able to think about space and thinking about who conversates within that space um, is not guiding it in a way that's so tight, you know, it's, it's leaving that room for the unknown. Many of your murals are deeply rooted in storytelling. How do you incorporate storytelling into your visual art and what role does narrative play in your work? Um, I would say a, a lot of the, the murals aren't necessarily about storytelling. Um, mm-hmm. Those ones are, I, I look at them more as conversation piece and, you know, having a, a moment where a viewer can interact with a work and it start a conversation. So that, mm-hmm. that conversation is then fueled by landscape, um, also the environment, the architecture, the idea of thinking about some of these concepts and ideas within urban spaces, I def- or wherever it may be. I mean, I've, I've done murals that are in institutional spaces, and that has a different context than it would if it was in an urban space or if it was on a reservation. Right. So all of these ideas um, kind of interacting on itself and then posing a question. So I actually don't create murals to make a narrative um, in any way. If I had to think of it in in that kind of context, it would be more about forming a question. Um, My personal work that I do um, has definitely been more rooted in the idea of storytelling. Um, For the past five years or so I've been creating large scale works and the majority of those works have been centered around Diné creation stories. Um, And I would say while there is a narrative base, um, it was really, that work in particular was really about self-examination. It was about kind of the art and gift of storytelling. So understanding first, I guess, like coming in to un, to learning these stories, but knowing that there was there's very very few um, written retellings or recordings of these stories. Um, if they are, it's like in this academic sense or anthropological sense. It's often done by people who are not Diné, who are maybe like uh, you know white academia. Um, mm-hmm. And it has this like external 
kind of view into like our most sacred understanding of and ways of being. Um, the other part of it is the own my own recollections from people, my community members, my family of hearing these stories throughout time. And then also like went into the weird side of it, of the internet and like just <laughs> research from that point of view to see what was right. being said from even this like mystical native <laughs> kind of lens and what was, you know, because this exists. I mean, does, all, yeah. of these, all of these are existing at the same time. And um, the gift and I think the brilliance of storytelling is that whoever tells this story is always putting themselves into it. And they're also always putting a moment of time um, and action. And I do see our storytelling tellings not only being this recollection of the past and grounding, but also like this guide into the future, because you are kind of having this glimpse of the past, present and future all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And a good storyteller will do that. Right. And so when I started creating this work, one was to be create these kind of illustrative um, narrations of glimpses and parts of our creation stories, but to be able to give agency to the storyteller so that th that this imagery would invoke a story, um, that this imagery would in invoke the continuation of our stories. So. Um, and that I invited all of those conversations to take place um, because I think that you can do that and for them to also be like these immersive environments to be something that was very real and inescapable. All of that series of work is, <clears throat> they're 10 foot tall paintings. Um, and yeah, so that one is like kind of like teetering, you know, kind of teetering on this edge of being narrative having an element of storytelling and then also not what challenges or opportunities do you encounter when translating traditional Diné or navajo cultural motifs and symbolisms into contemporary art forms yeah i i mean there i think that there's a sensitivity you know that you always have to right understand and think about um, because many of many of our symbols, many of um, the stories that we hold are they're sacred. That some of them are um, they're they're not to be seen. You know, some images are not to right. be seen or seen at certain times. Um, so I think understanding that and having that sensitivity to those um, ideas is very important to consider. And I, I mean, not only that, but like every art, right? Like sometimes I, I think I encounter work and I, I question, was that really necessary, you know, or was it just mm -hmm. too provocative, you know? Is it is it just kind of like poking the bear a little bit to like get a reaction and make it, make it memorable? But really like that, if that is, if it is just, you know, to be provocative that what is the intention of that, um, of that provocativeness? Like why, why, you know, and, why, and if I do right, make right. those decisions to do something that maybe would be taboo or that I understand, um, as my role of the artist and kind of like, uh, navigating this and putting this imagery out there that I understand why I'm doing that. So how do you see art contributing to conversations around topics like social justice and cultural preservation? And do you engage in those yourself and in actually incorporating those into your pieces? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, I mean, and that, that conversation has to start with, um, with where art is seen. You know, mm -hmm. we we have to think about where art is seen and recognized. And one of the main reasons why I chose to be a public works artist beyond trying to find my way into a gallery or trying trying to like identify my work into an into an institution, although all of that is valid because these right. are all spaces we interact intellectually with one another, and we also interact intellectually with one another on on the street. 
um, or at least we should, but mm -hmm. it was really about accessibility um, and understanding that the people that I most wanted to engage in these conversations with, because they are conversations about like, uh, land and language acquisition. They are about, um, you know, censorship. They are about motherhood and agency and autonomy over the female body. You know, like they're, they're all of these conversations, the people that I wanted to engage in these conversations were not always welcomed or invited or comfortable within institutional spaces. So I couldn't rely on only showing my work in institutions or in galleries to reach the audience that I made this work for um, and wanted those conversations to happen. So um, I think, you know, our, I, I don't, I view art, of course I love art, art is great. Um, <laughs> I view it as a language. I mean, it, it is a language that we are all, we are all capable of understanding and engaging with. And I think that that's its most powerful, it, that's its most powerful resource of it. Mm. We talked briefly about uh, collaboration, and it seems to be an important aspect of your work. Can you tell us about some of your memorable collaborations and how they have enriched your artistic practice and your own knowledge of yourself in creating art? Yeah, I think, you know, um, probably my favorite collaborations have been when I've gotten to work with elders. Um and really kind of create these longer drawn out projects that are like this recognition of what they're most proud of or what, like, I don't know. I almost can't even <laughs> explain like the enormity of being able to work that close with somebody who is just like wildly inspirational and has come to like this part in their life where, you know, they're not interested in like, being seen they're not interested in any of these things they're just interested in giving right. and they're interested in spending time and like honesty and um you know it's just it's it's beautiful in those ways um but also just like to hear somebody just like rattle off their knowledge or rattle off on a topic that they've had a lifetime to process and it's surprising and it's nurturing um, at every step of the way. And I think that those have been the pieces that I've been most grateful to, to create. Um, one in particular was <clears throat> with uh, Doña Maclovia Zamora, who was a longtime community herbalist, had a total plant-based pharmacy in Albuquerque and we did an extended project um, that was you know basically it was about urban medicine you know and, and understanding mm -hmm. the urban the urban um, I want to say like the urban plant-based pharmacy that is all around us everywhere and teaching that to children um, and learning the uh, learning concepts of empowerment within that process <clears throat> and having the kids, having her empower the kids and having the kids empower her. And so there's always this exchange that I'm very thankful for. That project in particular, I think, had so many layers of exchange. It had so many layers of gratitude, discovery, knowledge, um, and then also just being able to work with her and you know, there, I, she, she's very reserved, um, kind of shy, quiet woman, but <clears throat> was very, I, at one point I painted her portrait and I, I didn't know if she would go for it. Um, <laughs> I kind of thought she was going to like, be like, no, it's fine. No, don't do it. And I showed her a sketch of it and she, she was like so happy. And I said, I just, I want to do this because, we, you know, we always recognize people after they're gone and mm -hmm. I want people to know you're here and like how beautiful you are and like all of the knowledge you have. And just, I want to celebrate you while you're here and to say that. And she was totally about it and was like, okay, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that was truly rewarding. And I think um, just, you know, really 
interesting to see see that process unfold. And at that time, I mean, I feel like sometimes I'm just a reporter, you know, or maybe I'm just like a producer and set up this scenario and then I'm able to record it in an artistic sense um, because the work that happened happened between the exchange of her, her and the students I was working with. Is there a particular like middle, piece? Middle school age, huh? Is there a particular piece that you can think of that you were surprised at the reaction and got you, it received as well as one that you were surprised at of the lack of re reaction it received? Um, the lack Good of or bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't, I, I'm like, I don't think I've ever thought about that. Um, <clears throat> usually I kind of like, I finish a project and then I'm just like, I, I try not to like monitor it. <laughs> it's like, it's alone. I mean, it's, it's alive and it's alone on its own. It's right. on the board. So I'm just like, I just like leave it alone. Um, well, maybe a reaction that w w once it was completed and installed, it could be printed reaction or write up about it. And it's like, wow, I didn't think about that or. I'm surprised people saw that or yeah, the interpretation I think, of. I think most things are pretty, um, pretty positive. Um, again, because <coughs> I think that they become very close reflections of, of community and that the community, because it, because it started in that way and process it wasn't like oh i'm like i'm just gonna stick this thing over there you guys got to deal with it and react to it it's there's already been a reaction process and a synthesize mm. of that reaction and maybe a, like a critic or something like oh that's so ugly but like i'm not really worried <laughs> too much about that i i'm more i'm more like like what does the collective community what are the people are, who are passing this thing every single day feel and um, one occasion, um, I did this mural that was about indigenous food source, and it was in in um, Battle Creek, Michigan. And Battle Creek, Michigan is where Kellogg's food started. Mm -hmm. And it was this kind of, I mean, basically, that's to me, the birthplace of commodity foods um, and under and this exploitation of corn and GMO and all of these things. Absolutely. And the whole community has kind of suffered this systematic repercussion of all of those things. And at one time it was like a boom town, which is also very weird and juxtaposing of, of all of those ideas. People thought like, wow, this is great. We're going to be billionaires. We're going to live in a utopia. Right. It, it collapsed. It's also you know, um, health, you know, it's health concerning. And I did a, um, a mural that was based around kind of coming back to understanding surviviance through um, the landscape and food that we consume and kind of letting go of these notions that, that we need a company or we need some kind of system to provide this food for us. And I did the mural on a bodega and <clears throat> the people of battle and it had a, uh, it had a bunch of foods and it had a woman holding a baby breastfeeding. And I had actually taken the reference for that photo or for that painting from, from Madonna with child. And when I had shown the sketch for that piece, it was met with a lot of resistance. And I had to explain that I wasn't going to change it. They wanted me to change it. Um, they were like, maybe it could just be on her lap or maybe. And it's like, no, because that doesn't stress the importance of breastfeeding. Um, mm -hmm. And it, that, that is a, a statement. That's where we learn. That's where we learn about food. That's the first mm -hmm. time we, we have an interaction with food. And um, it wasn't until I brought up to him that I wasn't going to change it. Absolutely not. Because this is actually a very, like the reference for this is a very known European celebrated reference photo, except in this depiction, she's brown. 
and she looks indigenous and we can celebrate the, the plentifulness, the bountifulness, the health, the prosperity of European white motherhood. But when it comes to indigeneity, it's censored. And Correct. I, and I wasn't going to do that. So <clears throat> it was met with this kind of repercussion in the beginning. And, you know, I was kind of already like there. I was like on my way, like this is moments before I'm like getting on a plane, I thought everything was fine. Um, and then it wasn't. And then I was like, maybe I'm just going to go home. <laughs> um, and they left it up to the woman at the bodega to make the choice. And she hadn't seen the sketch. She had just said, "I the wall is fine. You can use it. And when she saw the sketch, she said, no, I love this. This is exactly what I want. This is perfect. And she was very, very happy and excited. And I was happy that they gave it up to her, you know, to right. make that choice. I think they <laughs> thought she was going to say, oh, no, it's got a boob on it. Like, <laughs> just <laughs> take it down. So, um, but no, she was like, you know, very gracious. And and that was really interesting because the, the community, that bodega also acted as the main supermarket. So it was like this hub of the, the neighborhood and a lot of, a lot of questions, a lot of, you know, especially by kids, you know, kid, like a kid was like, what is that baby doing? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? And obviously that, you know, that's the kind of questions I want to hear. Those are the, those are the conversations that need to happen, you know, because mm -hmm. obviously that baby, you know, has never seen natural food come from a person before, you know, sure. they start pumping yeah. into milk. Your, your use of color and symbolism is, is striking. Um, could you discuss how you select colors and incorporate symbolism into your pieces to evoke certain emotions or messages? And where is it coming from besides you, but where is it being derived from in your mindset and vision? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I like the boldness of textile patterns. Um, I, I started out drawing and creating work that was very representational. And then I guess before that with the graffiti was really like this abstraction of letters and it was colored and it was bold and it was like all about being eye-catching and kind of having this play and boldness between what you were making to make it mm -hmm. noticeable on, uh, you know, in a second, right? And, but also like the complexity and color choices of textile weaving of it could be very, very minimal, like a three color palette, or it could be very complex, like, um, you know, like an eye dazzler rug and have so many colors, except they work very harmoniously with each other. And I'm always inspired by that. Um, I'm always looking at that and kind of creating that feel where you can have something that kind of grabs you, that kind of punches you, but also isn't like, you know, it's not like too tutti fruity and just overwhelming <laughs> and like psychedelic or something. Um, <clears throat> so those are the, those are the things I think I look at, and I think that there's communication, that there's harmony, that there's a presence within that that you can understand ideas of complexity and layers um, within color, and also like how not to make it too overwhelming or too, um, you know, where it just becomes hard to look at and, and mm -hmm. you can't digest it all because there's so much happening. And the patterns are really interesting. I, I, I love, I love, our, I love the way Dene make rugs. I love the way that we make that. Our, I love our traditional rug making. I think it's one of the most beautiful and complex, complex forms of abstraction. And when I look at them, I see, I see story. I see, I see our landscapes. I see, um, ideas. I see, um, our philosophies. I see all of these things kind of working together. And I think that, <clears throat> um, for me, I'm always using those elements to kind of guide the idea, um, or maybe the subject of the work, um, into another place. And mm. use that as maybe like the spaces between words 
um, that you fill in with thoughts and, and ideas. Makes sense. Muralism and is always public space in a public space. How do you see public art impacting communities? And what do you hope viewers take away from encountering your murals? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think public art is, is very impactful. And I think that that is probably why most of it is bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> because a lot of it is run by a bureaucratic process um, within corporations and others and institutions, yeah. right? Yeah, and and also within states and cities and all of that. And you know, they don't want anything too crazy. You know, maybe put up a sculpture of a mayor or something. Um, right. So for me to create this work. Um, I'm, I'm happy. I want to bring as much people into that conversation as I can. Um, when I'm, when I'm given the privilege to be able to make work in a public space on this enormity, that's also funded. I mean, mm -hmm. these projects are not cheap all the time. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of moving parts and mechanisms. Um, I started from a place where I did a hundred percent of my work for free for 10 years. Um, it was wow. all out of myself, you know, of course, as a graffiti artist. Um, and I still, you know, sometimes you operate at a loss, but to be able to create this work and share it in that kind of capacity is the goal is not to, the goal is not the funding. The goal is to finish the work. And um, I think that that's the reason, you know, a lot of public work, get censored and sometimes you have to move those avenues around that yeah I mean <clears throat> kind of going back I, I hope it I hope it engages them, them in a conversation you know maybe not right away but I hope that you know I, I'm always first and foremost acknowledging that this is that this is indigenous land that this is a land of history um, not the history that we have been taught. I don't, I don't believe in creating narrative historical murals that like depict the, you know, the thing, right. um, that this landscape has a voice, that this landscape has transitioned and moved throughout time. And we're, a, we're a part of that. And the questions that we hold and that we carry and that we move within this space will also be transformative within time. So, um, I think a lot of public design and infrastructure um, is created to, to divide us. It's created to create these, you know, moments of division. I think that's why we moved to a grid instead of circular um, mm -hmm. urban construction is that it's really about kind of limiting interactions between people to have free and expressive thoughts. And I don't, I don't hope, I hope that if anything, somebody who encounters my work had a moment or a pause in their day or in their life, or just in that second down the sidewalk or whatever, to think something different than they were thinking before. The one aspect of the show is to engage artists and hear their personal stories and journeys. For those that do not know who you are or have seen you work, what do you want them to know about you as an artist? Um, then I'm a mom. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, that's probably the biggest other side of my life that isn't always out there. And um, I have, I'm, I have an 18 year old, so he's like a young adult. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, being a mom is, is like such a huge part of my life. That's probably like even the bigger thing than making art or, do, or creating artwork or any of it is, is, um, you know, watching him and facilitating his growth and all the other things that come with that. So <laughs> yeah, that's a big part. What drives you as an artist? Um, probably just, I mean, I, I, like I said before, you know, this, this is the voice I speak. This is, this is the language I know the best. Um, I, if I could write, 
eloquently or, you know, <laughs> I would probably do that or, you know, anything else. But, but these are all ideas. These are things that swim around in my head and there's no other way to release it. Um, there's no other way to kind of process these things except finding the way to do it. And that process becomes what I do. What motivates and inspires you? Um, motivates and then inspires me. I think it's different all the time, you know? Um, sometimes, you know, that motivation and inspiration comes from people that I get to work with um, or the projects themselves, because I think that, you know, it sometimes they present, present challenges and those challenges are really interesting to me to like figure out and, and have a way to incorporate, you know, different ideas within that. Um, sometimes, like I said earlier, you know, there'll be this maybe idea or something that has been in the back of my mind or kind of keeps popping up in different spaces. And mm. that could be something troubling. It could be something traumatic. It could be something historical. Um, but sometimes that, you know, figuring that out in time is what becomes the motivation and inspiration to creating a piece. Um, What's coming up next for you? Yeah. So speaking of, um, I recently am a recipient of creative capital and had been wanting to create a, a sculpture piece um, probably for about 10 years now. I've been thinking about this sculpture piece that I've been wanting to make and um, receive creative capital this year. Sculpture pieces I, are incredibly ambitious, not something that I've ever attempted before. And definitely like a new realm of work um, and kind of medium, the whole thing for me to think about. And so I will be working on that piece for the next five years. Um, wow. Yeah, and it'll <clears throat> it'll be housed at the Navajo Nation Museum, which I'm really, really happy to work with. Fantastic. And um, create... Um, one, be able to, to, I, I think, you know, getting big grants like this and, and getting that kind of thing is also really important because it's, a, it's nice to be recognized, I guess, in the, in the big art world, right. Mm -hmm. Um, and be in, in these institutions. But for me, it really doesn't do a whole lot unless we're also bringing some of that back home and we're able to uplift the people True. within the communities and, mm -hmm. And to share those ideas with the people who understand it to the deepest level. Um, <clears throat> so I'm excited to be able to work work with the museum. We have we have a great museum there. Um, it's been uh, suffering a little bit since COVID, um, and I'm I'm really hoping that this will generate so much engagement not only mm -hmm. engagement around the mural that will be part of the piece but also um being able to uh just kind of reactivate that space and be able to to bring bring people in there um and then also to create this work so uh this is yeah a totally different venture and i'm i'm excited to be able to create it See how well, it, congratulations see how it to you. Goes. That's fantastic. Five Thank years. You. That's a, <laughs> that's a w long time well spent, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it, it, it can be, I mean, it can be anywhere within that. So um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how long it takes. Well, it's been an extreme pleasure to have you on our show today. Thank you for taking the time to come on and chat with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we will chat with you soon, Nani. Take care. Thanks. You too. Thank you for embarking on this artistic journey with us. Keep exploring, keep creating. Until we meet again, let your imagination soar beyond the art. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on your preferred podcast platform.